<laughs> Welcome, everybody, to the Thursday edition of the Not Your Average Investor Show. We've been talking a lot about investing in the path of progress and how doing so will create better returns for investors. And the idea of investing in a city where an urban core is about to really blossom is one of the best ways that you can guarantee being in the path of progress. And today, we have the ultimate insider of the ultimate insight of the ultimate city that's about to blossom, talking about the three biggest projects that are going to change the skyline, the economic situation, the lifestyle of Jacksonville forevermore. I'm your host, Pablo Gonzalez. With me, as always, a man that I like to call GC because of his genius concepts, because he knows how to generate cash flows, because he's a great co-host, and because his name is Greg Cohen. You're supposed to tell me when I'm supposed to say hello. <laughs> I, can't, I, I, I can't do it Screw unless it you up. tell me to say hello. You know, uh, say hello, Greg. Hello, everybody. Great to be with I'm you. I'm proud that you knew how to fix your microphone <laughs> almost the way that you should. How about this way? And with us is the guy that you are really showing up for. No offense, Greg. <laughs> hey, none taken. If you have ever read anything about real estate in Northeast Florida, chances are his name was mentioned. He has been um, associated with as the Steve Jobs of Northeast real estate, the Tasmanian devil of Northeast real estate. Really what he is, he is a one of the greatest evangelists and cheerleaders for our local economy who has been bringing investors and bringing stakeholders to the table to create these, these really, really intricate, not easy to do deals because it's a unique talent of understanding real estate, people, and being a really nice guy. Alex Afakas, welcome to the show. Thanks. Happy to be here. New intro for me. Oh, always. That was, that was better than yeah, the last one. You know, kind of Steve, little, Steve Jobs, that's not true. But, I like to, I you, like know, to you know, love being here. With once, you. once I found out that this Tasmanian devil thing was taking hold, yeah. now I want to see what else people can call. Yeah, why not? Steve Spur, Jobs. Throw it out there. Estate. You're welcome. I've you got a few nicknames. I mean, do we want to go down the nickname route? I think we can, <laughs> but that's not the sex, section of the show. That being said, speaking of path of progress, speaking of seeing the path of progress and all these projects that we're talking about, we are super happy to announce that we have sold out the Not Your Average Investor Summit that is happening in February 16th and 17th. Honestly, kind of shocked about how quickly tickets went. Yeah. And because of that, we've started a, a wait list and the wait list is filling up as well. And we're looking at ways to incorporate everybody, but- it's, you know, keep signing up for the wait list. We're looking for ways to incorporate more people. It's clear that you want to come walk this downtown area, connect with each other. It's going to be two days of education, connection, and secrets, insider secrets, 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 secrets. of what's happening down here in Jacksonville. You will, for those of you who have signed up, there's going to be an announcement for a JWB block of Airbnbs that are going to be announced early next week. There might be a discount in there for you if you Maybe. act quickly. If you play your cards so, right. If you play your cards right. So just keep your ear to the grindstone or your email or however else you signed up out here. But really looking forward to this. I mean, it's this has been so fulfilling already, even going from idea of doing the, the summit three years ago and seeing you know, our first time and then the second time and we had double the amount of people that were there last year. And then this year, there's going to be probably double to triple the amount of people. But keeping what made this whole summit and this community special is really, really important. So, you know, more folks, more, more a bigger party, but the same old party we had last year is going to be a ton of fun for everybody. Love it. And if you come, you'll get to meet Alex. You get to meet Greg. You get to hang out with me and you get to meet the folks that take part in a little tradition we have around here. You know what the tradition is called? Is it roll call? Oh, baby, this is the nickname time, GC. We got the mystery man kicking us off. Danny Davies. We got the MVP. You may have heard of him. Lee Bishop. We got a very special... Uh, spe oh, special mom's lady. on. Mom's on. Oh, Mama Terracana. Mama Jane. Mama Jane. Mama Jane, the original investor in JWB. That is true. Right? One right. of the two. Right. We got the uh, ringmaster in the house. Drew Barnett. We got the early bird in the house. Mr. Dean Curry. Not the first ticket for the summit, as is tradition. Clear. We got beautiful investor from Minnesota, Lita Song. Good to have you back, Lita. Good to see you, Lita. We got Steven Shmielewski. I got to get I gotta get used to pronouncing that yeah. name without being insecure. From Providence, Rhode Island, making a habit out of it. Steven, we love having you here. We got somebody here from the illustrious Hudson Valley of New York. That would be Christopher Con Saga. Christopher Consaga. Welcome to the show. We got the Shaw map. Nadim Shah. Nadim Shah. We got our regulars, Gary and Rosalind Riley from Murrieta, California. We, we regard you. you. We got Leo. You don't regard them? Come on, Alex. You don't regard them? Come on. You got to regard them. 
<laughs> we got Leo Paragana. Dun, 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 dun. Paragana. Dun, 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 dun. We got the MVP. You may have heard of <laughs> Lee Bishop again. Yeah, Lee. Oh, did we already say? Yeah. All right, he was just saying hi to your mom over here. We got the Maven from the mountains of Denver. Leslie Wilson. Leslie, we got the patron Santorios of the Not Your Average Show community. Michael Santorio. We got <laughs> Kelly Green. Kelly Green from the luminescently blanche mountains of Colorado. Nice try, Billy. I can pronounce all those words. We got Reggie Fonts. Reggie from SoCal. Good to have you. All right, Rich. New name. New name. name. (laughs) Welcome to the party. We got Big Papa now. We love it when he calls it Big Papa. Pops, how are you, my friend? Greg Cohen's co-founder of the co-founder. We got uh, Buenas tardes, amigo. Tres amigos from Bill Shields. Bill Shields. That's a Bill. 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 Good to see you, Bill. I I need you working on those plans, Bill. I can't be watching the show. (laughs) We got the mama bear of the community. Miss Cody, Cody Adams. Miss Cody Adams. Stan, Stanley Jocelyn saying hello, everybody. New, new, name. new name. Welcome to the show, Stanley. Good to have you. Uh, Maria Totino is back. Hi, all. Jean and Maria from West Palm Beach here. Multifamily real estate investors in Jacks. Love it, Maria. Fantastic. Love to have you and Jean on board. We love when people make it a family uh, a family affair out here. Speaking of family affair, the Johnsons. Misty and Troy are in the house. One of the top 10 uh, attendees last year for the Not Your Average Investor community. We love you guys. Number nine, snuck right in there. And speaking of families, the first family, the patriarch and matriarch and Duchess Karen are in the house today. We We salute salute you. you. The Malines, good to have you. Thank (laughs) you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jerry Rodriguez is back. Says thanks for the conversation the other day. Happy to have you back. All right. Jerry. And um, we named our black cat Taz because he's a Tasmanian devil. They named their cat after you, Alan. <laughs> it's amazing. It's real. That's real impact. Really, right there. really. Warms <laughs> my heart. <laughs> Let's get started. Let's do it. We love the show when Alex is here because uh, it brings out all the buddy comedy in here. But I think the story here of two best friends that went to high school and college together, then one best friend convinced the other to quit their job to start a real estate investing company that ended up specializing in rental properties and falling in love with that asset class that bought 40, then had 300, now has over almost 6,000 under management, 6,000 under management, and now has purchased 20 city blocks of downtown Jacksonville. It's pretty common, right guys? (laughs) Yeah, it's like every day. It's every day, every day. Greg, can you just kind of just give us the the behind the scenes of like, was this always the path or why is this happening? Why are you guys ascending in such a way? Well, it's great to have Alex here when we're talking and going down memory lane because he and I both know when we started this thing, we had no clue what we were doing. (laughs) And I was in a job that I didn't like. Alex was... You know, delaying delaying getting a job. And, you know, we we started to read books and learn about investing in real estate. But, you know, we had no clue. We were lucky to find mentors and we just thought about doing this business differently than most people. But to say that we kind of knew where we were going would be a complete lie, right? We were in learning mode and survival mode in the beginning. And ease of access and ease of getting into real estate investing was really important. We were just out of college. We didn't have any money. We didn't have, you know, a, we didn't have experience. It was about what access or what asset class gave us access. And so single family rental properties creates the most access for real estate. And so for us, we said, well, let's combine, you know, just uh no fear of failure, which we never have really had with these mentors that we have with our attitude and our effort. And we said, let's put that into single family rental properties because the least barriers of entry. And from that point, we started to buy our own rental properties and learn our own property management. That, those first 40 rental properties that we bought were, that was our learning uh, experience. And from then on, so on and so forth, of course, we continue to uh, evolve. But You know, I think so many people say, listen, you know, maybe you start with single family rental properties and then you you go and you evolve into multifamily and you evolve into apartments, you evolve into commercial and you evolve into maybe redeveloping a downtown. For us, we love single family rental properties. Our business has continued to be dedicated for 18 years to single family rental properties. We almost can't understand why everybody's like, well, let me just go to the next bigger and better thing because single family rental properties create this access so that everyday investors can do what we do while also creating great profit potential and mitigating risk. And so we built our entire business off of it. Then the opportunity came 
to have more impact. And that's really where our evolution into downtown started to go down. I love that. You guys talk about not having experience and maybe not having money. I think what you guys had was uh, what we call chutzpah, right? You had uh, that that unique kind of like energy and desire. And this guy right here, who is a world-class visionary, Alex, I, I've heard this story of 10 years ago, you come in your business partner and be like, hey guys, here's the plan. I'm going to get really involved in downtown. I know that I know that I'm the co-founder of a 150 recently turned $200 million company. And I expect this company to just support me in doing things downtown. Cause I think there's going to be an opportunity in about 10 years that we're going to capitalize on. You want to, you want to take me back to like what you were seeing and the reason why you decided to, to put so much effort into just downtown when nobody believed in downtown 10 years ago. Well, so I've talked about this before on the show, but, you know, really started getting interested in downtown when I went on the chamber leadership trip in 2012 and 2013, where the chamber takes 130 CEOs and you travel to another city and learn what that city did and, and really saw the impact that it had. Those cities were Cincinnati and Charlotte, the impact that revitalizing downtown had on Cincinnati and on Charlotte and said, you know, that's it's a no-brainer to bring that back to Jacksonville. And there's there had been a lot of people working on downtown already for a long time. And, you know, getting involved in those efforts was was really important because I saw the opportunity there. Also, you know, you know, at that point we weren't buying, you know, 20 city blocks or, or buying buildings. But what we were doing is buying land around downtown because we could see it was in the path of progress. And just knowing what was already going on in downtown or the DIA had been created, that back then you could buy the land in the neighborhoods around downtown for $2 a foot, $3 a foot. You know, now that land is going for 30 or $40 a foot. And, and that just that idea of seeing where the path of progress is going and investing ahead of it, in addition to the economic benefits of social benefits for the city in raising median incomes and, and you know, a rising tide lifts all boats were the two reasons why I was so excited about downtown Jacksonville and why we started, you know, investing in that. It was smaller dollars at that point, but we bought a lot of land, a lot of lots in the neighborhoods around downtown. Um, and and it, it ended up working out. So. And, it's, and it's working out. And we're going to talk about just how much is working out because from 10 years ago when you guys are just buying a lot of lots, now people are putting a lot, a lot of money into yeah. <laughs> into, into these lots. Um, and that was this aha moment for you guys on alignment of impact you can create and getting in the path of progress. And I think as we as we have like explored those topics over the last couple of years on the show, something else has really come to light for us, which is how this doesn't just put you in the path of progress, but how you can put other people in the path of progress with the rental properties and what you're doing over there. Do you see, you wanna kind of like teach us about that? Yeah, you know, now 18 years in the business, in order for us to take a big move resources wise, align our team, align our financial resources around an opportunity. It has to be more than just one singular win. It has to be a win across the board. And so when Alex came back 10 years ago and he said, listen, we are going to be a major driver in downtown Jacksonville, and we're going to start to do those things. The wins that we saw across the board were uh, very large for for everybody. We first looked at our local community and we said, how can we make an impact on our local community? And whereas all communities have uh, struggles and challenges and opportunities, one of the things that I think everybody would agree on that's really, really impactful and what we all want is raising median incomes in your community. I don't know. I don't know anybody who says they don't want that. You know, we can all agree on that. And when you think about us putting our time, energy, talents into redeveloping downtown Jacksonville, we quickly realized what a change agent that is and how that brings higher median incomes. And so we said, okay, our community wins when we do this. And we thought about our clients and we realized that we manage 6,000 homes and we saw the impact on uh, redeveloping and revitalizing downtown on raising rents and raising home prices in those single family rental property workforce housing neighborhoods that are surrounding a downtown. And we said, wow, this is the best thing we could do for our clients as well. We're able to raise uh, home prices. We're able to raise rents. We're able to raise median income so they can support them. 
And our clients don't necessarily have to take the risk of putting all their money in downtown. They indirectly get those benefits. And we said, wow, a huge win for our clients. And then, of course, there has to be a win for JWB. And there will be a win for JWB, but it's many, many years down the road when it comes to these downtown projects. And because we're so focused and long-term focused here in Jacksonville, we, we've been here for 18 years. We're not going anywhere else. We have planted our flag here. It allows us to be patient and to make sure that we are going to be able to be here for the long haul, making the right decisions and not be, you know, impatient money, right? Impatient money sometimes makes, you know, moves that aren't necessarily good for everybody else. So, and then actually to that point, it says in our fund docs in the downtown fund, it says that the fund is going to act in a way that will be best for downtown Jacksonville, because that's what we think will, will build the best long-term returns mm. For our investors, which mm. is not something that is in a lot of, no. of fund, no. but because the fund, our investors, the way we're looking at this is, you know, a 10 year, 15 year, 20 year investment, that that's important that you're not doing things, you know, you can do a development and plan on selling it in two years and make money, but it might not be the best thing for the downtown, the community, whatever the surrounding areas. And, yeah. and so it was really important to us to not just say that, but actually put it in writing in in our, our documents. So. Which is not normal. And the money, we'll talk about the funds that are raised in these downtown projects, which I know we're excited to learn a little bit more about today. But just keep in mind that we were very selective of how we raised that money. All of that money that is going towards these projects is this patient, Jacksonville-focused money. Mm -hmm. it, it's not money from outside that you have to produce a return on investment next year or the year after or else they're out right? That's how a lot of these big projects end up not working out the way that you want. So we've been very selective, very particular about how we're going about this, the people that we're working with, the, the funding that we have. And that's why we're able to have this impact that we all get to share with you who are coming here at the summit in February and share with all of you, whether you're there at the summit or not as a client, right? We get to have this big collective win our community, our clients, our residents will win too as median incomes continue to rise. And of course, JWB will win down the road when we accomplish all these things. I love it. As a, as you guys know, I'm a Miami guy. As a Miami guy that has seen downtown be developed by people from the outside with short-term windows and and this like idea of, yeah, I think flipping got coined down there, right? Yeah. That, that, that whole thing. I've seen how if you're not focusing on median incomes, things fall down by the wayside. But what we have learned and the way that you guys are doing it based on your learnings on this chamber trip and this like slow wealth building, long-term outlook, writing it into the contracts, being selective about investors, when you maximize for median incomes, then the tide floats all boats, right? And the way that we've been illustrating it the best inside of our show and for our community and the reason why so many people are coming to the summit, whether they already invest or are going to invest is that we've gotten really clear about the idea that when it comes to rental property investing and the five profit centers of cash flow, tax savings, debt pay down, inflation hedging, and home price appreciation, the idea that home price appreciation, when you look at it in a pie chart as we're looking at it here, makes up the bulk of the wealth that is being created, um, maximizing for home price appreciation when you see it across many, many different portfolios, like we're seeing it in this illustration, when you can affect the biggest piece of the pie for those of us that are invested around the areas and in these homes, and you can bend the curve on home price appreciation, you're taking this whole like Pac-Man and making it bigger. You're making the pie bigger and you're making the biggest piece of the pie bigger, which is why we're so excited to talk about these specific projects that are really, really game changers. You guys Anything you want to say on that, you see, Alex, before we get into these problems? I'll add one more bit of data there to, to complete the circle here. It's great to see that this is the biggest driver of your overall wealth when you invest in single-family rental properties. But if you look at the data, the cities that have undergone a revitalization of their downtown over the last 10 years have outpaced the, the national average for home price appreciation. There's 27% more home price appreciation in revitalized downtown cities. So not only is it a bigger part of the pie, and we're going to make sure that we maximize that, it's a bigger pie overall because you get to ride the wave of a revitalization going on downtown. And I, th I think the one thing that we, we've done before, but not 
on this show today is the connection between revitalizing downtowns and raising median incomes is that typically when you have a revitalized downtown, that is that is where the best and the brightest want to live, want to go. And so it attracts talent, which attracts companies, which attracts more talent in this virtuous cycle. The the greatest a great example in Florida is Tampa, where you know eight years ago Tampa had brain drain. Their best and their brightest were leaving to go other places um, for jobs, and now Tampa has actually a net in migration of college graduates. And so they've been able to change that largely through revitalization of downtown, which has brought companies, which has brought amenities and and really, you know, raised Tampa's profile dramatically, you know, on a national scale as far as how people think about Tampa and regard it. And so that's what we are we are definitely expecting to see happen here in Jacksonville over the next three, five, seven years. Well, we got one project in specific that really hits home on that one, but I'm going to save that for now, right? Because I want to I want to start with the story of you talk about selecting investors and you selected investors in a very particularly way, particular way, Alex, you, when we got the, you know, the equivalent of bird scooters, I think it's called like Lime here or, or, or whatever. What are they called here? Do you know? It was, uh, oh man, we have bird and Lime now. Yeah. It was Hellbiz. It was Hel- the Hel- 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 right? when, when the modular scooter system came in here, you as the visionary that you are was like, aha, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to just call up all my friends, everybody that I know that like knows a little bit about investing and likes to take take advantage of an opportunity. And I'm going to start parading people around on these scooters to show them that this is no longer a city of renderings, that dirt is being moved, that what I'm doing over here and what JWB is doing over here is also being done by corner lot over there and is being done by these other stakeholders. And it's not just us talking about it. You started showing people around. You started raising interest in this thing and you started bringing in money. Um, but there was somebody that was already there. Right. There was old money here in Jacksonville that started that started putting in a bunch. And this is the 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 project that's gotten the most headlines, I would say, that people outside of Jacksonville know about is ShotCon, the stadium renovation and the shipyards. Can you just kind of give us like a, what is this project, what it represents and why it's good for the city? Yeah, I mean, Shad is has been a, a huge asset for Jacksonville. He's obviously put a lot of money into Jacksonville and downtown over the years. You know, all the all the renovations done to the stadium, from the scoreboards to the clubs to the practice facility to Daly's Place. You know, he's kicked in half of the capital, even though they're, they're city-owned assets. So it's, it's huge to have the Jags and Shad here. And so now, you know, we have the oldest stadium in the country that has not been renovated, oldest NFL stadium in the country. And so it's time for us to do a, a renovation on our stadium. And the plan that the Jaguars have is is phenomenal. And we're super excited. You know, right now, the, the Jaguars are already building the Four Seasons. Um, just south of the stadium that is under construction right now, which is over $300 million project, incredibly high end food, beverage, hotel, spa, the river, river walk, riverfront activation, marina. That's going to be a, a huge asset for Jack's and downtown. And then the stadium renovation and the development of the neighborhoods around that is really the next phase. Right now, the city's you know negotiating that with the Jaguars and we, we can't wait, you know, very confident that that's going to come to fruition and, and very excited to see what that does for those neighborhoods. And like we've been saying, you know, these sort of, of large catalytic developments attract talent, attract mm-hmm. jobs, attract investment, which raises median incomes and, and improves values and rents in the areas all around it. So. We're excited. Let's help people understand the progression of some of these projects and how they actually get to the point where dirt is being moved and maybe let people know what's actually happening right now. Because I do think that if people are talking about future developments in their city and whatnot, it's very easy to put pictures up that look like this, but those projects may or may not ever happen. This is different right? The the dirt is moving. If we drove right there where the Four Seasons is going to be, you would see dirt moving and cranes there's, and all that good there's, stuff. There's a slab, there's cranes. They literally have a concrete plant. Yeah. <laughs> they have their own concrete so it, plant. It goes outside. from... It's, it's going. It goes from like idea to proposal and you can fill in all the gaps here, but we are we are actually at the point with the... Not just is the money there, mm-hmm. it's actually being spent. It's, it's under moving. construction. It's under construction. Yep. And this is a sign. There's $4 billion of active construction projects going on in downtown Jacksonville. I've done my research across other downtowns. I haven't found another downtown that has $4 billion of active construction going on right now. And this is little old sleepy old Jacksonville, 
right? So I just think it's good as we go through some of these projects, make sure people know that this isn't just an idea. This isn't a rendering. This is, this is actually happening, which creates the urgency factor as far as being able to invest. Because right now it's this beautiful moment where even though we know what's going on, now all you all know what's going on. There's a lot of people in Jacksonville who don't know what's going on. There's a lot of people outside Jacksonville who don't know what's going on. And so you have this opportunity to make wise investment decisions before you really see a big pop that we're expecting. Alex, can you speak to, I believe that most people hear stadium and they think rich dude getting tax breaks to like fill his coffers. This one is different, right? The idea that there is the stadium deal, that's a public private partnership that's happening there. Um, but there's also the shipyards and the Four Seasons and the fact that Shad is already putting in a bunch of his own money around it to to develop this area. Can you talk about the the uniqueness of that when it comes to cities working together with with NFL owners and why that is something that is going to make this more feasible and better for the city itself? Yeah, I think, you know, Shad has always put in you know, always match the city and in, in their investment in these city owned assets. So I think that 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 idea, you know, it's a rich guy getting handouts is just it's not it's not true. Like they're investing real dollars and grant there's there's not another person in Jacksonville that could invest the type of dollars yeah. into Jacksonville that that shot has. And and I think, you know, when you look at how and how st- NFL stadiums get built, you know, for for cities that are in the, the lower quartile and overall revenue and population like Jacksonville is, mm-hmm. you know, the the city or the municipality normally puts in 70 plus percent of the dollars for the project and and we're, what the jaguars are proposing on this is a 50 50 deal so it's a it's a better deal than what you see other stadiums in, in cities like jacksonville have gotten which is great you know shad is willing to do that willing to invest in the community and then the other part about it is it's not just the stadium like what they're talking about is revitalizing the whole area around the stadium, bringing in food and beverage and entertainment and housing and a lot of redevelopment to the east side neighborhood, which is a historically underserved neighborhood just north of the stadium district. The Jaguars have already given massive donations to, you know, the historic east side CDC. They've been working together for years. They're very invested in that community. And so it's really a commitment. The Jaguars are showing a commitment, not just to, hey, let's get a stadium deal done so so we can make more money, but in a way that's going to be great for the city as a whole. Can you talk to, so you're somebody that's involved with economic development, right? Can you talk to the idea that how having a four seasons hotel in the mix of all of that actually helps the recruiting a Fortune 500 CEO to like build the headquarters and having these like developments be like, and this is where your VPs get to live and stuff. Yeah, like it's it's huge. I mean, you know, those sort of of big name brands that that everyone in the world knows. And it's kind of like what like having an NFL franchise does for Jacksonville. You know, like people here, Jacksonville, like, oh, they have an NFL franchise. Mm-hmm. They must be of a certain quality to mm-hmm. have an NFL franchise. And I think having something like the Four Seasons just is another notch, you know, on that post where it's, you know, one of, if not the, the best hotel brand in the world. And so now, you, you know, you have this really great high-end amenity, like you said, for your executives, for your friends, for, for whatever. So that's yeah, huge. First five-star hotel in downtown. Yeah. 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 Listen, if I'm, you know, we've, not to brag, but we've had a Fortune 500 CEO on the show before, right? <laughs> Gary from FIS. And and listen, if I'm if I'm out there, if I'm out there trying to convince people to move here to work for me, and I'm doing the whining and dining, right? Like you guys have JWB's growing gangbusters, right? Like if you if you want access to talent and you want to bring world class folks like you do here, you gotta have a re- recruitment trip, mm-hmm. right? Like, mm-hmm. like, you know, there there isn't there's an inbound population here and you need somewhere for them to stay that you can be like, man, this is beautiful. You see that you see the future here. You see all this stuff kind of happening and being able to put them up at a four seasons to say, we're going to move you and your family and your finance department that is in Cleveland. And now they want to move to better weather, you know, like all these different types mm-hmm. of things. Like I, I see a, a direct tie to, to that type of activity, which is necessary. hundred percent. hundred percent. All right. So now you mentioned it earlier. So that's number one. That's the first of three Big dog projects coming that are that are going to change the city. I feel like everybody's heard of that one, right? Maybe not. You just you just tease this thing, right? Downtowns change. 
when top-notch education facilities show up, which reduce the brain drain because now it creates jobs and stuff like that. Let's talk about project number two, the UF graduate campus in downtown. What is it? Why is it important? Well, why is it important is exactly what we talked about. So UF is going to be bringing a um, graduate and postgraduate and research um, institution to downtown Jacksonville. There's three sites that they're looking at right now. The state, the city gave 50 million to kick it off. Private stakeholders raised 50 million. And then the state last year gave 75 million. We're, we're hoping that the state will give another 75 million this year. So a total of about $250 million to raised for this center. We don't want to say campus, Yet there's, there's things that come along with that for, for this this, gra- this graduate and postgraduate center, and and what that will do is exactly what we were talking about. You know, when it kind of opened, is reverse that brain drain, like attract it, actually create the best and the brightest here. And when you have a tier one um, research institution like UF is, mm-hmm. you know, I know Wall Street Journal just named UF the number one public institution in the country. Go Gators. Um, go, Gators. go Gators. You know, and typically any, any um, you know, publication you read, UF is top five public institutions in the country. So to get number one from the Wall Street Journal is pretty, pretty amazing. And, and so when you have that here, it will automatically attract other companies that are wanting to to hire and to grab that talent, which will only increase the job base and then attract more talent and increase the job base. And so that will raise median incomes all throughout Jacksonville and provide opportunities for, for everyone in Jacksonville. And in addition to when that happens, then you have the economic development for the community where you will see rents go up, home prices go up, especially once median income goes up to support that to still keep it affordable. So very, very excited for UF to be coming here. You know, we've been we've been working with with UF throughout this whole process. You know, we're we're kind of on the front end from concept to raising the funds and now helping UF understand what programs could best work, um, where the campus could go. So we're we're working hand in hand with UF right now to to provide whatever help we can, just like a lot of other people in the community are. UF is doing a lot of outreach right now to companies to leaders to to see how how they can can best fit and that's they're they're hoping to open you know temporary space in you know 25 26 and then the full campus in like 26 27 was kind of the last i heard so yes i think it's if we connect the dots from where you started the story about you know 10 15 years ago when alex is like hey listen business partners here's my big pitch to you. I'm going to go spend all of my time and a lot of money making people happy around Jacksonville. And then like 10 years later, 15 years later, it's going to be a payoff. Well, I think this graduate uh, downtown center here for the University of Florida is one of those incredible payoffs for the city of Jacksonville. And it blew my mind. As a Jacksonville resident, and as you may have heard, a former Miami resident, I'm, I'm super pumped for this as like prosperity, right? When I was working in economic development in Miami, we were like, man, we have access to money. We have access to, you know, like we we have all these people that want to live here. What we would kill for is a world-class institution to power the talent ecosystem, the research, the internships and cheap labor that that, that, that allows, right? Like the idea that companies want to be around that and get first access to that talent was monumental. As an investor who owns three properties around downtown with you guys, I think, okay, the students from UF you know, the UF grad school, the professors from UF grad school, the administration from UF grad school, the maintenance department, you know, like they all need places to live and they're going to want to live close to work. And to me, just directly without even talking about raised median incomes, I'm thinking, I mean, you're just adding more demand for the housing stock that you guys offer investors around the urban core. Is that Accurate. Yeah, it's just going to continue the population growth. I mean, actually, I was looking at the there was some John Burns as a consultant that we use, and he's been uh, on the show. We know. Friend of the show. Sorry, Friend sorry, the show. sorry. And Jacksonville this year is is fourth in the country for for positive in migration, and so those trends have been super strong for a long time, and we would only expect them to accelerate with what's going on in downtown. Love it. Anything there, GC? No, I mean, I, we think this is one of the biggest, most influential projects to ever hit downtown Jacksonville. At Jacksonville I mean, as a whole. So, I mean, I think, you know, you, you talk right. about, you know, consolidation was a huge thing that changed Jacksonville. You know, getting the Jaguars was a huge thing. And mm-hmm. then, you know, when when FIS 
and FNF, the Fidelity groups of companies moved here. That was a huge deal. And all the, the companies that spun off of that and 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 getting a, a UF graduate campus is right up there with those things as far as 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 real needle movers for the city. Am I wrong in in the like I, I know I heard this somewhere. I know for a fact that UF has like the biggest AI supercomputer in the world, mm-hmm. right? Like they they have in some, higher education. In higher Yeah. The federal government has bigger ones. Okay. Well, whatever. <laughs> That's not a competition, Alex. <laughs> so AI has the biggest AI supercomputer in higher education. And this program, from what I believe, is very much tailored towards AI powered fintech and AI powered healthcare tech. Is that still accurate? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, something that that UF is doing is really trying to infuse AI in all their disciplines. I mean, AI is going to change how everything works um, in the world and the country. And so and where a lot of other institutions, most, you know, kind of they headquarter AI in their engineering and sciences department. The idea to make it really cross-disciplinary mm-hmm. and infuse AI into everything yeah. is something that, that UF is really focused on. And so that is going to be a huge focus in tech, med tech or the, the campus here. Sounds like the path of progress to me. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So speaking of path of progress and speaking of things that are going to change downtown forever, the third most important thing, you know, not in order, right? Like out of our three things here is something that I think is truly unique. And it's this Pearl Street district that is coming to downtown. Alex, before I get into it, how do you describe this thing and its relevance? So the Pearl Street District is the first phase of Gateway Jax's um, development. And that is that is the fund that that we started. We raised $20 million locally, got DLP, who's now our, our partner on the project to commit $200 million in capital. We hired Brian Mole as our CEO. Brian has done $6 billion in urban mixed use in Tampa and D.C. And so we bought 20 city blocks in downtown Jacksonville. We're going to do about $2 billion in development over the next eight to 10 years. And so the Pearl Street Districts is the first phase of that. It is uh, three high rises, uh, 23 story tower, two seven story towers, all with ground floor retail, really focused on building a true neighborhood in downtown with an amazing experience at the ground level. So think, uh, you know, um, outdoor seating with restaurants and great streetscape and sidewalks and trees um, and, and boutiques and gyms and grocers and really having that true neighborhood in downtown. Um, and the reason that it's able to work is because we have that scale. We have 20 city blocks. This was just the first development, really the core of it. And so just like, you know, the other developments we've talked about, this will add a, a tremendous amenity for downtown that has that has not existed in downtown that will attract people to live downtown, Mm -hmm. which will attract talent to Jacksonville Mm -hmm. and therefore attract, you know, companies. And so we do think that it'll have, it will help Jacksonville's upward trajectory as a city, even though it is, you know, a real estate development at its core. So fired up about it. Brian and his team are absolutely phenomenal. I mean, they've, from where the the vision that, that, you know, we had when we started this, to bringing Brian in and Brian like kind of talking about his vision to what's actually happened. It's, it's we've blown everything away. Like his team has been able to outperform everything that we thought was possible. And we're super excited about this. And there's, you know, follow-up phases that we should have. It's about four phases right now that should, we should start about one a year for the next, next, you know, few years. Cool. Can, can you talk a little bit about what it took to to set this up? Because I think that's that's really fun and exciting. I know that was that was a fun time for you to be acquiring what what we did I mean, at the helm of that. And then also just talk about landing Brian, yeah. right? Because Brian was you can tell what what yeah. he was doing, but it was it's not easy to bring that talent here. Yeah. What did he see? That allowed him to to jump on board. So the first question about how it all came together, we just started buying little pieces. Well, we're in 2019, we bought Sweet Pete's, which is in the core downtown, and then the two buildings north of Sweet Pete's. And then, you know, when you're doing urban development, it's really important to focus on an area of strength and then just kind of work outside of that. So we just started, you know, looking at real estate, just one block, one block, one block. And we ended up acquiring a lot of parcels. And, you know, now if you look at a site map, like a Pearl Street district, you've got a whole city block. It's like, oh, that's a nice, well put together city block. But that was eight different little tiny pieces that had to get put together. So there was a lot of work that went into the acquisitions and the underwriting. And how do we, uh, putting it all together. I mean, we started buying property in in 2019, 2020. 
Um, and really, it, it took three years to acquire most of the, the real estate. And that's why the, one of the reasons why this project is unique is because we have, you know, a, a, a tremendous amount of real estate mm-hmm. all close together in an urban setting, you know, really in the core. I mean, we're talking, we're eight blocks away from the river, mm-hmm. you know, t- two blocks away from, you know, James Wilton Johnson Park and City Hall. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's in the middle of the heart of downtown Jacksonville. And so it, we think it's going to be a, a really, really tremendous project to open a break ground, you know, end of end of this year, actually. Talk about what GC asked. Brian, friend of yeah, the show, yeah, going to be at the meetup, yeah. right? Yes. So yeah, well, yeah, he is. You'll get to meet this extraordinary to... gentleman, or you can watch a past episode if you can't make it to the meetup. But talk, talk about that whole, speaking of recruiting projects. Yep. Well, we didn't think we had a chance to get Brian. It's funny. So there was, so Brian in 2016, uh, he, he started his, his career in DC in 2016 was recruited to Water Street Tampa. So we talk about Tampa a lot. Mm-hmm. Water Street Tampa was the project in Tampa that really kind of brought downtown Tampa to the next level. Jeff Vinnick, who was the owner of the um, Tampa Bay Lightning, bought 50 acres around the Tampa Bay Lightning um, arena and and did $4 billion in, redev- in development. And and Brian was on the forefront of that. And it was funny because I got connected through the, the mayor of Tampa, Bob Buckhorn, who was the mayor during Tampa's resurgence, connected me with the CEO of Water Street Tampa, of SPP, which was the developer of Water Street Tampa, James Nozar. And so I was talking to James and he was just helping me out, just like, you know, free consulting. And he mentioned Brian's name. We were, we were talking about, you know, you got to get a really amazing development guy. And, and then, you know, Fast forward a year later, we hired a search firm and they were like, hey, this guy, Brian Mull, would be amazing. You know, he's by far the the best guy, but he's got this great job in D.C. And I talked to James he's like, yeah, James said, no, Brian's never leaving the job. Yeah. He's, not, he's not coming to Jacksonville. You know, you can try, but he's got a pretty sweet gig up there. Yeah. And but, you know, we had a conversation. He came down to Jacksonville and we introduced him to the mayor and Lawyer Boyer and, and Daniel Davis and like a lot of the, the community, the, the Jaguars. And he was just blown away, not only by the real estate that we had acquired, but like what was actually happening in downtown Jacksonville and the way that the city, it seemed like all the stakeholders were coming together in a way that he hadn't seen in other in other cities, even Tampa and D.C. And so, you know, it was at the end of that meeting, he basically said that he was in and that downtown Jacksonville in 2022, this was a year ago, a year and a half ago, was a better opportunity than Tampa in 2016. He said, this is the last place in the country that this sort of opportunity exists. He took a pay cut and moved down to Jacksonville from DC and has been loving it you know, ever since. And he's built an absolute rock star team and they have been, been killing it. But yeah, I thought that was, was crazy that, you know, that a guy who is so well-versed mm-hmm. in urban redevelopment and 6 billion, you know, said, with a cushy not, job in DC, which not only, city. not only, yeah, and he was uh, in DC. What he was doing, he was running the Amazon HQ2 project. Like that's a, <laughs> no, that was his project, by the way, yeah. the Amazon HQ2 project yeah. in DC, uh, just outside of DC. But that this was the last place in the Southeast, which is in the last place in the country because it's in the Southeast, that this sort of opportunity existed and a better opportunity than Tampa in 2016. And so you go back and you look at what's happening in home prices in Tampa. Yeah. You know, in the neighborhoods around downtown in Tampa yeah. from 2016 until now, yeah. and you're like, oh, oh that makes yeah. sense. Okay, yeah. that makes lots sense. of progress. Yeah, lots of progress. So, yeah. So, yeah. so, just to recap here for everybody following at home, we just kind of told the story. Right, we're talking about these three projects, but within it is a story of two guys that went to high school and college together, decided to start a real estate company, fall in love with rental properties, end up just becoming world-class at making rental properties work, realizing an opportunity in their own hometown where there is this last canvas that you can paint this like world-class 16, you know, like last supper kind of world-class, what do you call it? Mural on. Yeah. Go out there and not just acquire 20 blocks of a downtown of what is a blossoming city with a, NFL franchise and a Four Seasons Hotel and things of the sort, not just acquire 20 blocks and and figure out how to do that, but then lead a recruitment effort to go find the most talented person out in the country that could possibly then pull this thing together to spearhead a development, get him to like relocate here, get him to see the vision. And now you guys are in the first phase of a $2 billion development 
that is a live work play thing and it's going to turn downtown from a and correct me i don't know the numbers correctly but from like an eight hour city to a 16 hour city is that is that what you sharps yeah, call the, it the hours I and mean, right now there's there's 7500 people that, that yeah. live in downtown but yeah i mean when you, uh, during the week when when it hits five six o'clock there's not a lot of people on the streets down there and, and so i think you know that the concept of turning it into an 18 hour city is absolutely correct. Yeah. yeah. So explain 18 hour city, GC. Yeah, it's it's similar to what we were just saying, right? A, a 12 hour city is a city that basically is only there when people are working. So a downtown where people are only working, right? They get there or or, or an eight hour city or what, whatever it may be, right? Where you get to that point of being an 18 hour city, that means that there are bars, restaurants, amenities, people stay downtown. And, you know, we think we're on the same trajectory as some of these other cities that have made that leap from 12 hour, eight hour city to 12 hour to, to 18 hour city. Austin is a great example. I researched the downtown reports for the city of Austin. I've seen them year over year talk about where they are. Well, if you go back five years ago in Austin or 10 years ago in Austin, it was talking about the same things that Jacksonville is talking about right now. It's talking about how to get more population growth. Well, if you look at the downtown report, the state of downtown report for Austin for this year, I just you can go Google it uh, right there on the front. It says we've arrived as an 18 hour city. And now these are great stats to look at yeah, here. Yeah. So this is numerically what it means. Residents living downtown. Well, in 2010, you had 7,600. That number sounds familiar, yeah. right? That's what we have in Jacksonville right now. But because of a lot of the same concepts that you've heard on this show that have come together and are working in unison, Austin has become an 18-hour city. It's now, it has 14,300 residents living downtown. And I don't know if people understand why this is so urgent, though, because when you make that leap, the numbers start to work for developers. Once the numbers start to work for developers without any city incentives, because there are so many people living downtown and spending money downtown, a whole lot of developers want to be there. And the numbers start to change very quickly. And that's when rents go up dramatically and home prices pop and go up dramatically. So that's why, that's why we're going to be doing the summit. That's why we do this show is to share that investment opportunity with all of you. And Jacksonville really is that next downtown to pop. And it's really great to know right at that moment, right at that moment before it starts to pop, like that's when we all want to actually like make the investment decision, right? Not all of us want to be early pioneers. Not all of us want to do what JWB did, you know, back in the day, right? You know, for everyday investors, you have this opportunity to make us an investment decision right before you start to see the same things that have happened in Austin, in Tampa, in Nashville. And so we're excited to share it with all of you, especially on the summit. Those scooter tours that we were just talking about that Alex started to do many years ago with all of his friends here in Jacksonville. Well, we're doing that same thing with all of you for the summit. So um, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be getting a, vehicles. We're not going to have a hundred. Yeah. It's not going to be scooters. It's not going to be scooters. Not going to be scooters. Marauding around. Time. You can see where we're going though. And this is why we're so passionate about sharing that message. What I find really interesting is that we have all sorts of real estate investors and not real estate. I, I, I don't really call myself a real estate investor, even you though should. I am, I am getting to five doors right now. Yeah, right? you are. But the idea is. You can be a big dog like you guys and the, the money that you're raising for downtown. You can devote your life to it and go try to, you know, you now have an information advantage, right? If you're listening to this right now, you have an unequivocal information advantage, which anybody that's an investor would kill for, mm -hmm. right? Like it's illegal to have this kind of information advantage in other asset classes. In the stock market, in the stock market yeah. <laughs> right? But in real estate, it's perfectly legal, right? So you have an information advantage. So there's a couple of options. You can move down to Jacksonville and go knock on doors and find the best deal and renovate it and do it and make a ton of money doing it. Or you can take advantage of the inventory that you guys have been amassing for the last 15 years, take advantage of the machine that you have built for the last 15 years that makes the asset perform and call it mailbox money in this investment, right? Like buy one of these single family homes around the urban core that you guys have plenty of to offer and you have all the staff and all the maintenance people and all the things that allow you to do this while sleeping really, really well at night. I am a witness of that. And that's an easy first step in that could then lead to, yeah, who knows? Maybe one day you're doing this kind of stuff, but like at the very least you are creating wealth for yourself with a tactical advantage.
Absolutely. Well said. Well said. You want some? What, 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 yes. what are I going to do to was, get you one of these homes? That was really good. You like that? You like <laughs> that? All right. We got a couple of questions here. You guys ready to jam on a couple of questions? Let's do it. All right, cool. Patron Centorius, Michael Centorius says, Cushman and Wakefield reported last week the fourth quarter Jacksonville vacancy rate was unchanged at 19.8%. What's interesting is class A was up by 73,000 square foot. Class B was negative 78,000 square foot would say that these large projects are the reason more class A properties are being filled? Well, it was interesting. I mean, the the large projects, like, like Greg talked about, you know, some have delivered, a lot of them are under construction right now. And so we have not seen a lot of that, like there's the, the Jack Chamber does a tremendous job driving new companies to Jacksonville every year, every day. So that has been happening. I think the the growth that we're going to see from these large projects has not happened yet. So I don't think that is it. Something that we are seeing in the marketplace in office is this flight to quality. So what's happening is, you know, you have a company, let's say they had 50,000 square feet. And then, you know, some people are working remotely. Some people are working from home. Now they only need 25,000 square feet. What they're doing is instead of cutting their budget in half and just getting 25,000 square feet, they are moving to a nicer building. And so they're only cutting their budget by 30%, getting 25,000 square feet, but paying more for it in a nicer building with more amenities in downtown cores. So, so you know, so in Water Street, Tampa, it's actually really interesting. The, the office properties in Water Street, the new construction in these walkable neighborhoods are getting like 30% premiums to some of the other older office buildings in downtown Tampa. So I think this we're going to continue to see this for the next, you know, three, five, seven years in the office market where you're going to have a flight to quality. And so, you know, I personally would not want to be owning like a, a C-class office product in the suburbs right now. So that that is why I think you're seeing A-class, you know, occupancy increase and B and C-class decrease. And that is why everybody talks about Alex F. Falcus as a real estate expert, everybody. Flight to quality, you heard it here first. <laughs> Mystery man, Denny Davis says, Alex, you look great behind the microphone, brother. Congrats. <laughs> Thanks, man. Tangentially related. <laughs> What is the latest on the development and future of Jacksport? What should be more, that should be more fueled on the developmental fire, right? Yeah. I mean, Jacksport is on fire right now. I mean, they're, they're expanding. I mean, they're, they're, they're filling up all of their space so that the, the, the deepening of the port uh, finish and actually finish under budget. Mm -hmm. So we've got a lot of these larger, you know, Panam, you know, Max Panamax, post ship, Panamax, post Panamax ships yep. that are that are coming in, and so they are needing more space at the port. There's a couple of extremely large parcels that they are looking at opening up for development mm -hmm. um, right now. So yeah, we're going to continue to see growth from the port, which really drives the logistics industry well, here, which is yeah one of the five biggest industries here. So so yeah, that is that is only going to be continuing for Jacksonville. Jacksonville and Jacksport's super phenomenal. strategic because the other ports in Florida. Required you to drive five hours before you can even get out of Florida yep. and get get your cargo right, anywhere yep. else, right? So yep. Jacksport is a yep. big deal. Great question. Alex, this should be an easy question for you to answer. You can do it briefly. Alex, with the amount of experience that you have now with business development, relationship building, passion for Jacks, talent for bringing people together, have you thought about running for mayor? Is the next step? No. Listen, Hell no. Okay, cool. That's an not easy even not, not running for nothing ever. <laughs> Never. No. That's the running joke. No, I, honestly, 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 I I appreciate like public servants that run for office. It is a tough. It's tough, tough right? job it's tough. and like that being willing to serve and yeah. do that. But no, it's not for, not for me. Well, um, well we'd like you here. It's one of my many nicknames for him is the yeah. mayor. Yeah. Maybe, maybe you can run for YouTube influencer though. All right. So here we go. Not your average guest says I was looking at purchasing a JWB home on 639 Chestnut street, Jacksonville, Florida, 32205 back in December of last year, I was going under contract and had a hometown heroes grant that was going to assist with the down payment and closing costs. It ran out before sending the binder. Is there any other grants or minority grants that can assist with helping on a down payment? So there are, there's, you know, both you have the, the state programs that get funded, you know, once a year, normally through like CBDG grants or things like that. So there should be more money in those existing programs. You know, the Live Local Act was passed last year in the state, something like $700 million going towards affordable housing. So there'll be a lot more funding for those programs in the future. And the city is actually working on a number of programs right now, um, which should be putting pumping more money into down payment assistance. Um, so yeah, if you reach out to the team, um, we can help get you connected. We're we're actually looking at doing some first-time homebuyer education classes as well. But there's going to be a lot of money um, flowing through 
or affordable housing to first time homebuyer programs. You know, I was I was actually vice chair for um, the mayor's um, transition committee on affordable housing. Mm -hmm. And we wrote a, wrote a, a report. We put together a report that was, was really strong. And it seems like the administration is going to be taking a lot of those um, suggestions. So, yeah, there will be more assistance coming and then, for that. I'll add up just a couple of things, just because I happen to be texting Cassandra, who's a, a, a realtor on our team and is a part of JWB Realty Group and absolutely helps folks with, with this. I was texting Cassandra and I said, hey, which how much down payment assistance can people get? The H2H program is up to $50,000 that folks can get. There are AMI limits on it. Then there's other programs called the Hero, Hero yeah, Hometown Heroes, up to $15,000. And there's probably more as well. So if you do have questions, you can go to jwbrealtygroup.com, reach out to our team. I'm happy to help you with that. Heck yeah, I'm solving the affordability crisis. I love it. Mountain and Bella Green. Last two questions here. Last call. If there was a three-year process of acquisitions, were there any extended factors that happened within that time which affected the underwriting, good or bad? I, I can tell you, I mean, home, prices went up, you know, prices for land went up pretty dramatically. So when we started, you know, we were, we were paying a third of what, you know, we ended paying. Yeah. Well, no, it's just, <laughs> you know, it, people kind of caught on, obviously a lot of in, in 2019, there wasn't as much going on. So even, you know, when the, the four seasons was announced, so yeah. home pri prices in Jacksonville in downtown Jacksonville have been increasing. So we had to pay more. We, we were planning on that. So it didn't, negatively impact our underwriting, but we definitely saw that as demand has increased in downtown. Yeah, I would imagine the last three years have been challenging to say the least. All right, Mr. Man, Denny Davis, closing this out. Gentlemen, what a show. Are there any potential barriers on the horizon that would delay the type of rapid development that you are discussing? Yeah, you know, the the financing market is a big one. You know, like when you're, if you're doing a $400 million project, you I mean, you are going to need debt on that. So, you know, if if interest rates went up to 15% in the next year, or if banks just stopped lending, that would that would slow this sort of development. Mm -hmm. But we see, you know, when you you read the tea leaves and you look at what all the, you know, the futures market that predicts interest rates, like everyone thinks it's going to get better this year, probably towards the end of the year, rather than worse. So we see that as a as a as a small risk, but that would it wouldn't stop it; it would delay it, right? Mm -hmm. So, for instance, and in, you know, Gateway Jacks. If when we went to go to where we are going through with full construction drawings, and when we're ready to go to construction, if there was no debt at that point, we would have to wait until there was debt available. You know, we see that as a small risk, but that would only delay the projects; it wouldn't kill them. So, we would be first up out of the ground, ready to go whenever you know the debt markets were were we're back. So I, besides, you know, besides that, I, I see almost, I see very little risk to, to what's going on in, in, in downtown and in Jacksonville right now. You know what? There's probably a number of other things that could delay it. Right. But the, the key is to, to be like us, right. To be patient money, be patient money with your investments. And when you are patient, you know, and you have a solid strategy, you're going to be successful. So your patient money when it comes to single family rental properties is to buy and hold, right? Choose the right partner, choose the right market. If you have an opportunity to buy in a market that has this type of change agent, like we're talking about downtown. And, and extremely strong fundamentals and, as well. Exactly. Even beyond this change agent, right? The things that have brought, you know, the advanced additional home price appreciation to Jacksonville that we've seen even before this, right? Be patient. Buy and hold, that's how you're going to win. Yeah. That's what Warren Buffett says anyways. That's, I don't know why, but I believe that guy. Gentlemen, you did not disappoint. I A little bit less making fun of each other today, just because there was so much information. But man, the information, the energy, the insider secrets that you brought with you. Secrets. 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 Brings the crowd, man. We had 90 plus people here today. We still have 70 plus waiting, like still asking questions. Thank you community for showing up whenever we, you know, pull the strings to get Alex in the studio. It's, it's a lot harder it's hard. than you think. It's He's hard. a busy man, busy man with a lot of responsibilities, but he makes time for you uh, and you make time for us. And this really wouldn't work without you. We really are looking forward to seeing you at the JWB summit. That's the website if you want to join the waiting list. Make it tough for Greg to not have another one this summer. Just sign up for the waiting list. <laughs> Build up demand. Let us know that you want to come. Try to crash the party. I want to meet you. I want to hang out with you. It's going to be a lot of fun. And from here until the next show, hope to see you on Tuesday. Any advice, GC? Don't, Don't be average. average.